I had reached my lifetime max of chemotherapy and they had saved one, one last treatment and they were going to hold on to that for the end of life just so I could say goodbye. Chemotherapy does suppress the disease, it controls the disease, it kills cancer, but it doesn't, it, it mows the lawn, but it doesn't pull out the weeds from the roots. It's theorized that cancer is parasitic. And this is an anti-parasitic, it's just as simple as that. My neck, my liver, my pancreas, my bladder, in my bones, it was everywhere. Two years ago, Joe Tippin says he was told to go home, call hospice, and say his goodbyes. The doctors were unanimous. He was going to die of small cell lung cancer. Once that kind of cancer goes that far afield, the odds of survival are less than 1% and the median life expectancy is three months. Tippin says he went from 220 pounds to 110, but that was January of 2017. Today, Tippins is very much alive, and what he credits for his survival has doctors scratching their heads and the rest of us raising eyebrows. About half the people think I'm just crazy, and half the people want to know more and dig deeper. And... Tippin says he got a tip, not from a pharmacist, but a veterinarian. And in his desperation, he turned from people medicine to dog medicine, specifically fimbindazole, or what you give a dog when it has worms. Uh, truth is stranger than fiction, you know? Just three months later, <laughs> Tippin says his cancer was gone. I'm usually skeptical, and I was, and maybe still am about uh, this one. But there's, there's a lot of, there's an interesting background to this. Scientists at many credible places have done work on this for years. Tippins took the dog medicine with daily vitamin E supplements and CBD oil. He was also taking an experimental cancer-fighting drug. But Tippin says out of the 1,100 patients on that clinical trial, he was the only one cleared of cancer. Tippin says he was saved by the dog dewormer, and he plans to take it for the rest of his life. Oh, my insurance company spent $1.2 million on me with traditional means before I switched to a $5 a week medicine that actually saved me. And, and the next thing you know, uh, they, they do really well at the beginning. As a matter of fact, it looks like, whoa, miraculous. It's miraculous. As a matter of fact, it was shown, big paper published, that many of these drugs, they make the tumor look like it goes away, but you only live two extra months, 2.4 extra months. Can you believe this? I mean, we are so given so much misinformation by allowing drug companies to peddle their, their drugs on TV every night, giving the false impression to the population that things are really hunky-dory. And, and if you have a, a cancer, we know how to treat your special cancer. We have the tools. Are you kidding me? We got 1,600 people a day dying. And, and yes, we have a lot of survivors. People say, oh, it must be worried about a lot of survivors, right? But a lot of those cancer survivors pay a, a terrible price for their survival. I mean, they're mut surgically mutilated, they're burned, they're poisoned. I mean, a lot of times they have all kinds of other maladies associated with the treatments that they were given. Oh yeah, I survived my cancer. You know, it was really tough battle, all this stuff. But now you have digestive issues, hormonal issues, neuropsychiatric problems. You got all kinds of problems for surviving your cancer. That's, that's nuts. You shouldn't have all that. That's nuts. What are they doing? So, um, and the answer is, if cancer is a mitochondrial metabolic disease, we can drop the death rate by 50% in 10 years, and we can bring people's health back. Not only will you, yes, of course, this is uh, clear, um, but oh, you, it's impossible. Of course, it's impossible if the theory that you're treating the patients with is incorrect. That, yes, it is impossible. But if the theory changes to a metabolic disease, yeah, very possible. The problem is, no one has yet figured out a business model to make money on it. And until that happens, we must then be sacrificed uh, by the system uh, because we can't make money, enough money. Re revenue generation is the number one aspect of cancer. You got to generate revenue. Now, if I have a drug that can generate revenue and, and manage your cancer without toxicity, everybody will love it. But we don't have that. But we can manage your cancer without toxicity. The problem is we don't have, re we can't generate revenue on it. So these are the these are the these are the problems. And until the society steps back and says, "Yeah, we got to do something," it's going to be status quo. There's not going to be anything that's going to happen. So they're all going to run off to their Dana Farber's, MD Andersons, Sloan Kettering's, Fred Hutch, whatever they go, wherever they go, um, MD Andersons, right? They they run in there. They get all the different kinds of treatments, 
and they do good for a while. And then you hear, well, there's nothing more we can do. Uh, give me a break. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just tragic. It is the greatest tragedy in the history of medicine, this cancer thing. And, um, but you know, until we have to keep publishing the papers, we have to keep documenting all the case reports that we're showing. Oh, they say we don't have enough. I won't believe it unless I see a big case report. And then after you do a case report, they still won't believe it. So it's not, it has nothing to do. The outcome is why don't you look at all the case reports and how well they're doing and say, well, that's a fluke. He's a fluke. That's a fluke. This is a fluke. Well, one of these days, the patient's going to say, I want to be one of those flukes. So uh, the system has to change. If the system doesn't change, then it's going to be business as usual. And most people don't know this. 65% of an oncologist's income comes from chemotherapy, from the markup they're making off your chemotherapy. 65%. Russell Brand said this, and he was spot on. Another guy who's not a clinician but understood what's going on here. If we make things about profits and quarterly earnings and big business and not patient outcomes, don't be shocked when we get phenomenal quarterly earnings and piss poor patient outcomes. 65%. 65. And I attached the link just so we'd have it. So they have yeah. a financial incentive. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for being back to Growth Factor. Today we have my friend Kevin Hennings. He is a fisherman, former Marine Corps and fighter. The reason he's here today is he's been helping a lot of people. He had a deadly cancer, told to go home, call hospice, and a series of coincidences led him to take, to take some repurposed medications. And Kevin, I so look forward to hearing your story. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I got diagnosed in August of 2019 and uh, I was diagnosed diagnosed uh, right off the boat actually I was out on a boat and uh, collapsed and um, I, I got got back to shore went to the clinic and they told me that I had cancer they found out that I had very little blood in my body because it was all going to feed a tumor so I was very anemic I landed in the VA hospital up in Miami and that's where they diagnosed me uh, with stage four colorectal cancer I went to Moffitt Cancer Center up in Tampa and I got treated there. After about three years, they told me that I had exhausted all of my options with Western medicine. And they referred me to a, a social worker uh, for hospice, actually, to set up to make the arrangements for, for that. They, they were done with the curative care. The option was on the table for palliative care or hospice. I decided to take a proactive approach instead of a reactive approach just to scour the internet and and uh, see how much information I could collect. I ended up finding actually uh, medical clinical studies that were done through Western medicine, the same doctors, well, the same system of doctors that were treating me with chemotherapy and pumping that poison into me. Those same doctors are publishing papers showing that other medicines work. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see any papers that said that chemotherapy worked. I mean, well, chemotherapy does work. Um, if you know what its job is, its job is not to cure cancer. Its job is to control cancer, not to eradicate it. It controls it. And so it does work. Chemotherapy worked for me. It kept me alive long enough for me to find a, a repurposed solution. And after talking to the survivors, these people were no evidence of disease for years and years and years. And uh, after talking to a few people, I put, put everything together um, on a spreadsheet and I, I took a calculated approach um, using the medication that Western medicine clinical evidence showed um, complemented each other. So I put five ingredients together. I limited it to that. There's a lot of solutions, by the way. There's a lot of repurposed medicine that is effective in fighting disease. Five ingredients was fenbendazole, cucurmin. Uh, well, fenbendazole is an antiparasitic. It's a horse dewormer. Uh, animals take it. And uh, cucurmin is an anti-inflammatory. Uh, uh, Semitidine is the active ingredient in tagamet. AHCC, which is active hexose correlated compound, that's actually a collection of mushrooms. Anato is the only real 
valuable portion of, of vitamin E. Within six weeks, I had 50% less disease. And at 14 weeks, I had no evidence of disease. And since then, it's been nine consecutive scans uh, over, over two years where I've had no evidence of disease. And I've had uh, Signatera tests and, and uh, blood work done. And they, they can't find it in my blood. They can't find it in, in, uh, on any of my scans either. So apparently, there is a, a solution out there. What kind of cancer, where did it spread? And what did you look like at that? When the doctor said, go home, call hospice, what, what, what were your medical conditions? I was a little bit overweight. I was a, a, a professional athlete. So at one point in time, I was in very good shape, but then I was a fisherman. I had gained some weight and get a little wake up call, I guess. Over the years of treatment, I had lost almost a hundred pounds and became emaciated, a cachexia. It's uh, the withering away disease. And that is when somebody looks like they are from the Holocaust. Do you have any theories how you got cancer? I hear sometimes people talk about the spiritual, something happened as a child or stress. Some people feel it's chemicals or certain things you were exposed to. Do you have any theories where your cancer came from? I have a couple different theories. God needed to get my attention. Another theory of mine is the, the metabolic theory. I, I think that we are our own worst enemies. It is possible to uh, allow self-abuse to contribute to disease, to food. Um, I was just a, 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 a like a, a food junkie. I, I certainly, I may not have caused the cancer, but I certainly didn't close the door. What? How yeah. did you change your lifestyle, Kevin? So after I after I started taking the repurposed medicine, uh, specifically the fembendazole, there was uh, some diarrhea and stuff that there was a side effect of taking that, uh, but it was a, a couple days. And honestly, I was coming off of chemo. There was some things that were necessary for me to change because of, you know, my lifestyle had to change. They took out my, they took out most, the better part of my colon. They took out my rectum. I had a bag that I I, I was uh, defecating in an ileostomy bag. I had to change my lifestyle. It wasn't really an option. They eliminated the bag and they reconnected everything back as it should have been. They sent me home. That's when that's when the chemotherapy stopped working and uh, things progressively started getting worse. When I got everything reversed. My diet was a huge factor because I was a slave to plumbing and I couldn't leave the house. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't resume anything normal, no type of normal activity. I had to start intermittent fasting. I had to cut out a lot of carbohydrates and sugars and things that were going to constipate me. It was a balance of a carnivore diet and a keto diet. It depends if, if I did one diet, on Monday, then I guarantee you I'd do the other one on Tuesday. And that kept my bowels regular. That's how I was able to leave the house. I see people who really credit their diet for the most part. I've interviewed Pablo Kelly, had glioblastoma multiform, the brain cancer. And he really credits eating tallow, suet, red meats, fat. I've interviewed Guy Tenenbaum, who also, he, he had prostate cancer that spread everywhere. He didn't fully go carnivore, he was more keto with Professor Thomas Seafried helped him out. Big, big thanks to Thomas Seafried. He saved my life. He saved my life when I understood that cancer is a metabolic disease. Okay, you don't believe <laughs> I published all these papers. What part of it you don't believe? Oh, I never knew that. Oh, people say, I, I never saw that paper. Well, you don't read the damn literature. You know, if you read the literature, you'd be saying, oh, and you can't believe how many people say sugar has nothing to do with cancer. Now, sugar doesn't cause cancer. It's not a carcinogen. But if you have cancer and your blood sugar is high, you die faster. The tumor grows faster. It's clear. Hundreds of papers published. And then you go to an oncologist and sugar has nothing to do with cancer. What are you kidding me? These guys don't read the scientific literature. So I, I don't know what to say. I mean, what can you say? I'm on here talking on your show. I'm telling you and whoever's listening. Right? This is the way it is. They don't believe me. I'll sh then read my papers and see what you think. Right? If you say, I don't believe it. Well, hey, listen, there's a lot of people who, who actually believe stuff that 
that is 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 incomprehensible that anybody could believe some of these things. But they, what you know, what are you going to say? But anyway, you can always look at my papers and read the information. What is a metabolic disease for me? I've interviewed people that reverse MS. A lot of people I interview, they go mostly carnivore from keto to carnivore because they're just cutting out the sugars. They're cutting out the alcohol. They're cutting out the bread. So that's what helped that. The day you were told to go home and call hospice, how much life did the doctors guess you had to live? You know, was it a week? Was it a month? And do you think it was coincidences that day? Can you tell us about those coincidences or was it divine? Oh, well, I am so glad that you asked me that question. It was absolutely divine. Um, there was a, a, an absolute divine intervention took place on that day. They told me to go home and they, they told me that uh, they'd saved the last treatment. Now, I had reached my lifetime max of chemotherapy and they had saved one, one last treatment and they were going to hold on to that for the end of life just so I could say goodbye. It was estimated that that would be within the month. He had anticipated, um, they were actually scheduling for them to administer that last dose of chemo prior to the end of the month. So it was about three weeks. And then it was supposed to give me another week. They didn't think that I was going to live much beyond that. On my way home that day, uh, you, you asked about the divine, uh, the divine intervention aspect of it, which I'm so glad that you you asked me that. So on, on the, we were on our way home and uh, it was my wife and I driving and I, I was, man, I was so weak. I, I wasn't even strong enough to drive the truck. And I'm on the phone with my sister who was part of my support system. You know, she's a nurse practitioner. My other sister is a, kind of a spiritual person. She is a, a big church goer, huge into the institution of the church. She sees the sunshine and rainbows to everything. Uh, we call her Disney because you just can't rain on her parade. She sees the silver line and everything. So my medical sister was actually on the phone with me when I was in my appointment. This was when you couldn't have visitors. You know, you could you, you do your appointment in the middle of COVID and you couldn't have people accompany you. So I had, I had her on the phone with me. She understood the lingo of what they had just told me. And she was in tears. We can't be emotional. We have to be calculated. And our response has got to be calculated. It cannot be emotional. So I said, hey, you know what? Let's let's phone in my other sister. Let's call in old Disney. She says, hey, listen, there's this guy in my church. And he got diagnosed with colon cancer the same time you got diagnosed with colorectal cancer. And he opted out of Western medicine treatment. They, he, she said that he did like one round and he said, whoop, nope, not for me. No, sir. I'm out. What does this have to do with me? I just, I just got sent home to die. You know, come on. And she says, well, he opted out of Western medic medicine and uh, he's currently no evidence of disease. His wife, they're from South America and they do this anti-parasitic thing. It just as a matter of hygiene down there. She gave him this anti-parasitic medicine. Okay, well, I heard about the Trump thing with the ivermectin and the hydrochloroquine and Joe Rogan's taking this and, you know, he was during the pandemic. And, and I was like, come on, let's get back to reality here. You know, this is, you're wasting my time here with this conversation. And she says, hey, do what you want. Have a, have a nice ride home, you know. And uh, I mean, not like that. She, she's always so much happier than that. You know, the miles are just passing and the tears are rolling down my face. I don't even know where to start my research. I have no idea what to do. I got to call Disney. I got to call her back. And I'm like, hey, listen, you got that guy's phone number? Turns out this guy, his wife is a veterinarian. And she gives these animals for cancer the same drugs. And I'm like, well, wait a second. So there's some validity to this. So I call the guy up and he's on a, he's on a roof. He's laying the cement, concrete tile, whatever, laying those uh, tiles on the roof. And this is in September. And it, it's September 1st, actually. 
And uh, so the heat of the summer, 150 degrees. And this guy's swinging a hammer on, on a roof. And I can't even steer my truck on the way home. I'm so weak. And he tells me about what he's doing. It was just enough to send me down a rabbit hole. But that night, I, I'm up all night. Because the next day, I'm supposed to meet with the hospice people. And so I'm I'm up all night. It's the 11th hour. Like, I'm up all night. And I'm down this rabbit hole. This works. That works. All these things that work. From the earth. And keto this. And no sugar. The blah, 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 blah. All of it. Or I got to get all this stuff out of the way before my hospice meeting for the end. Right? So I had to take care of all this other stuff. I didn't even sleep. So I'm on my way to this meeting that I have to go to. And it's an unseasonably crazy traffic pattern. It pushes me into a direction that I normally wouldn't have gone. And I had to make a U-turn. And the only way I could have made a U-turn is to go into this guy's parking lot that I know. And he was like an abrasive guy back in the day. I hadn't seen him in years. But certainly not, you know, a few hours before I meet with hospice. I don't really want to get caught up in this conversation. So I stopped and I said hi to the guy. And as soon as I walk into his office, he says, oh, hey, Kevin. Wow, you look like shit. And I said, what? Dude, why did I come here? He says, he says, man, I haven't seen you in a long time. I said, well, if you didn't hear, I've been a little bit sick, you know, and, and uh, here I am at the end of this battle. So he's like, yeah, I heard. I heard. I said, well, I just came by to say hi. I don't want to take up any of your time or whatever. See you later. And he says, huh, it looks like you came to say goodbye. And I was like, whoa, what a dick. Who, I don't know who this guy is that's standing in front of me. He says, I don't know who you are. He says, you were the light heavyweight champion of the world the last time I talked to you. He says, but you're a winner. He says, this guy who stands before me is a defeated, deflated person. He says, you ain't a winner. I don't even know who this guy is. And I was like, whoa. I said, well, I'll tell you who I am. Ha! I'm the guy that just got sent home on hospice. And he said, yeah. So what are you going to do about it? And I said, maybe you're not listening to me. I'm going to die. He says, well, with that attitude, you will. <laughs> and I said, what a dick. Right? Like such a jerk. I can't believe this. He reaches in his top right drawer thing and he pulls out a big old tube of Safeguard Fenbendazole made by Merck. Now, you used to work for Merck, didn't you? Are you familiar with this product? Or yeah. you did PE drugs? You did people drugs. Well, this is a cattle dewormer, horse dewormer. They use it for dogs too. It's fenbendazole, which is an antiparasitic. He says, Kevin, about eight months ago, a friend of mine got misdiagnosed with esophageal cancer. And I saw myself, now this guy is not a, uh, he ain't a cowboy. He is a, uh, a very leather-bound, mahogany-smelling, rich folk type of person. He, his nails are clean. He don't dig ditches. He's a car guy. He collects antique cars and Ferraris. He ain't a farmer. No reason for him to be in tractor supply. And he says, I was in tractor supply getting a bladder for one of my trucks, a fuel bladder. While I was sitting there waiting, I look up and I'm thinking about my friend with esophageal cancer. And I see this is right about the time where the ivermectin and, and that whole pandemic thing was going on. And he says, I see the, I see the uh, uh, fenbendazole right on the end cap. I got it for him. And on my way home, he calls me up and says, hey, I was misdiagnosed. And so... I never gave it to him. When I got back to the office, I put this in my top right-hand drawer. Now, every day for the last eight months, I go to, and I, I go to get something out of my top right-hand drawer of, of my big mahogany desk, you know? And uh, as he's sitting back in his big leather-bound chair, every day he goes to get something important out of that top right-hand drawer. And he's got to fumble around with this big old cattle tube of, of horse paste, you know? And he says, so every day I, I, I get a little ticked off and I'm like, hey, 
I want to get rid of this. I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to throw it in the garbage, throw it in the garbage. He says, but every day I go to do it and something tells me not to do it. He says, as he's handing it to me, he says, Kevin, I've been saving this for you. And it was the same stuff that the guy on the roof had just sent me down the rabbit hole. And I didn't have a whole bunch of time for trial and error. I had a little bit of information, but I had even less time. So I took a leap of faith. What are the chances of me getting pushed to that left lane, having to make a U-turn in this guy's parking lot, his, his business? And uh, what are the chances of all these things coming into play and then him pulling out a big old cattle tube of paste of Fembendazon saying, Kevin, I've been waiting for you. So that day I left his office, I screwed the meeting and I said, I, I immediately pushed a, a full on tablespoon of that paste right into my gullet. And I started taking it that day. And I canceled my meeting with hospice at three o'clock that afternoon. And my wife wasn't having that anyway, she was not having the hospice thing about a week into it, you know, the, like I had some diarrhea first or whatever, but that subsided and everything started regulating after that. And I was like, huh. So then I'm like 10, 14 days into it, the energy shifted. All of a sudden, I wasn't a victim anymore. All of a sudden, ooh, what was that? I got a little bit of energy. And I immediately capitalized on that energy. As soon as I got the ability to move, I got up, I got in the shower, I, I, I shaved, I got a haircut, whatever it was. To, to self-care motion creates emotion and I had to get the blood moving as soon as that energy struck I harnessed it and and things started happening after that I put one day together with the next day and before you knew it I had a week under my belt I I remember when I was in boot camp same sister Disney when I was in boot camp in the Marine Corps uh it was back in the snail mail days but I remember getting a letter from old Disney one time. And it said, you don't have to make it through three months of Marine Corps boot camp. You only have to make it through 12 hours. And after that, you're going to go to sleep. You could do anything for 12 hours. And then the next day you do it again. And before you know it, a week goes by. And then that week turns into a month. That month is all of a sudden graduation day. If you put together a series of good days, before you know it, you're flowing. That U-turn was very symbolic. I think from above, they give us those symbols and your life made a U-turn as you physically made a U-turn and everything changed at that U-turn. Well, it has to make a U-turn, right? It has to make a U-turn because as soon as I got that energy, I committed to building back a better version of that guy who got sick because if not to build back a better version, why the, why the battle? Why the fight? Why would I fight so hard just to return to be the same piece? Of and I feel like I'm officially part of God's plan. And this is my purpose. Okay. What cancers does your protocol work with? or how? So there are plenty of solutions out there. And as long as there's clinical evidence, we entertain it on my, on my page. There's a few that have been proven that I have survivor testimony, clinical evidence to accompany it. And it, there, it, it is a medical protocol. I, I posted that stuff up there too. So, I mean, I'm not biased to my, my thing is my thing. No, listen, I don't make any money on this. <laughs> you know, I'm not selling you nothing. You know, this is what worked for me. And I could give you a list of other cancers that it has worked for. However, it doesn't work on things that are like the geoplo uh, geoblastoma. Mm -hmm. um, it, it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. You would have to add, I have other protocols on my page that, that do cross the blood-brain barrier. That's why God made flavors. 
You know, I mean, it's what worked for me might not work for you, but there are other things that do work that I, I can probably put a specific protocol to your specific genetic breakdown of your disease. And, and it's probably on my page. My final question is, Kevin Hennings was told less than a month to live. Something was going in his, on in his body. You had that muscle wasting disease and you take a fenbendazole. What, what was going on? Were, was your body filled with parasites from cancer, from the original disease three years ago? Why did it work? Because it's part of God's plan. Um, I, 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 I believe that. Um, I, I think that, I think that God has a purpose for me. And I think that he tried to get my attention a few times and maybe it didn't stick. And so he had to hit me harder this time. And I think that he got my attention. And I, I honestly, I think just cancer is the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, it, it helped me find a better person. It helped me help me have a funeral for the old Kevin. From a medical standpoint, it's theorized that cancer is parasitic. Chemotherapy does suppress the disease. It controls the disease. It kills cancer. Um, but it doesn't, it, it mows the lawn, but it doesn't pull out the weeds from the roots. So it suppresses it until until it stops working, then they change your chemo and then it starts working again. So there's peaks and valleys and peaks and valleys, but you never eradicate disease. It's They suppress it and it goes away, it goes dormant for a while, but then it comes back. And when it comes back, it's pissed. So fembendazole, it pulls it out from the root. There's all sorts of clinical evidence to support the efficacy of fembendazole in the eradication of disease. There's also other things that it does, promoting P53, uh, the, the number one thing that you have in your body to fight the uh, disease in, in your immune system. And uh, you know it, it catapults that to another level. All five ingredients, when they're taken in concert, they all complement each other. But fenbenazole for sure being the star of the show. To answer your question, it's theorized that cancer is parasitic. And this is an anti-parasitic. It's just as simple as that. There is so many, uh, there's just so many things that have been proven to be effective. Or if somebody introduces something with clinical evidence coupled with survivor testimony, I'll 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 let them post it. Where they where they take anti-parasitic medicine um, globally in those geographic locations, they don't have as much cancer. And they also didn't get COVID. We have a, actually a website that's under construction right now that's beatingcancertoday.com. And all of the clinical information is posted um, on uh, our group page of Facebook, Beating Cancer Today. And uh, we do a Warrior Wednesday uh, podcast episode. And we also do a Thursday monologue episode. So Wednesday and Thursday, we run video. Thank you everyone for watching my show growth factor and meeting kevin hennings as i said in the beginning he's a fighter he was a, a boxer a fighter and that was symbolic of his life that day on september 1st 2021 not only did his car make a u-turn he physically made a u-turn and a series of two coincidences happened to him that those of us who believe in a divine power it was not a coincidence so thank you for being a fighter kevin thank you for your facebook